Howdy folks, it's me, Josh. So today, I decided I wanted to talk about someone that I'm sure that any American would know about. A man who's become so infamous that a statue commemorating his deeds doesn't even mention his name. A name that's become synonymous with treason. But today, I want to explore how this happened. How a man who would have become a hero instead became a villain. How one of the nation's most promising leaders ended up turning his back on them. How he ended up becoming Benedict Arnold. Benedict Arnold IV was born on January 14, 1741 in Norwich, Connecticut. He came from a prominent New England family with his great-grandfather, Benedict Arnold I, serving as colonial governor of Rhode Island. His family had him sent to a private school, hoping to eventually send him to Yale, but it wouldn't be long before things took a terrible turn. In the span of five years, from 1750 to 1755, three of Arnold's siblings died from yellow fever, with only him and his sister, Hannah, surviving. His father became incredibly depressed, turning to alcoholism, and his family went into debt. Arnold's mother, who he grew a close relationship with after what happened with his father, had to pull him out of school, but still managed to get him an apprenticeship in merchandise. The previous year, in 1754, disputes between Britain and France in the Ohio Valley led to the outbreak of the French and Indian War, known outside of America as the Seven Years' War. And so, when the military came to Norwich requesting volunteers, Arnold decided he wanted to go out and fight. His mother, on the other hand, not wanting yet another kid to die, said no, wanting him to complete his apprenticeship instead. However, two years later, in 1757, Arnold managed to successfully enlist in the New York Militia, and deserted. Twice. Not off to a great start. He went back home and decided to just put up with it and finish his apprenticeship. In 1759, though, Arnold's mother died, and his father in 1761. Him and his sister were on their own now. Well, not completely alone, as he did still have his apprenticeship, which he completed in 1762, and was given a small shop in New Haven where he became a bookseller and a pharmacist. He became very successful and managed to buy several ships that he used to start trading in the West Indies before marrying his first wife, a woman named Margaret Mansfield, in 1767, though she would ultimately end up passing away in 1775. And so, Arnold would end up becoming one of the most successful merchants in the region. One of. Benedict Arnold had a very high self-image. He thought the world of himself. And so, whenever something happened or he made a choice, he only really thought about how it would affect him. And so, when the Sugar Act of 1764 and the Stamp Act of 1765 began to hurt his profits, he decided to fight the British laws and joined the Sons of Liberty. After the battles of Lexington and Concord in 1775, the American Revolutionary War broke out, and Arnold, now a captain in the Connecticut militia, decided to lead a force to Boston in order to help the siege there. Along the way, he learned of the potential held by capturing a fort in upstate New York called Fort Ticonderoga. And so, after the Americans won the siege of Boston, now Colonel Arnold rode out in order to attempt to take the fort. Along the way, he ran into some guy named Ethan Allen, who just so happened to have the exact same idea. Arnold felt he deserved to command the operation, but this led to a huge argument and Arnold having to share the command with Allen, managing to easily capture the fort. A few months later, Arnold pushed for an invasion of Quebec, and when Congress approved of it, he expected to be put in charge of the expedition, and was outraged when he wasn't. The expedition failed, but due to his strategic skill, Arnold would be promoted to Brigadier General. In the summer of 1776, his boss, General Horatio Gates, put him in charge of a naval fleet in Lake Champlain in upstate New York. General Gates gave Arnold explicit orders not to attack any ship without being attacked first, but when Arnold learned of a British fleet on the north side of the lake, he, thinking he knew better than Gates, decided to go out and attack the fleet, ultimately failing. His efforts delayed British attempts at invading upstate New York, but he disobeyed his orders in the process, which didn't reflect well on him. By the beginning of 1777, Arnold had requested a promotion to Major General, which Congress refused, giving it to other officers instead. 
And so Arnold's pride boiled over into envy of his fellow officers and a feeling of betrayal by Congress. And so Arnold, extremely pissed about all this, decided to ride all the way to Philadelphia in order to talk to Congress about the promotion they didn't give him. His arrogance and stubbornness in this whole ordeal made him plenty of enemies, but he did manage to make a few friends, most notably George Washington, who admired his skills. Arnold tried to resign, but Washington, seeing his potential, wouldn't allow it, instead having him go back up to upstate New York to defend against the advancing British. Still upset about not being promoted, Arnold wanted to prove Congress wrong as he went out with General Gates to fight the British in Saratoga. Arnold used his aggressive fighting to lead to a huge victory for America in the First Battle of Saratoga, but after the battle, an argument between him and General Gates got him kicked off the mission. But Arnold, being as stubborn as he was, completely disregarded Gates' orders and fought anyway, helping to achieve another victory. After his huge success in these battles, Arnold finally got his promotion to Major General, despite his disobedience. During this time, Britain managed to capture Philadelphia, but after this defeat, and France subsequently joining the war, the British felt they had to evacuate, and Benedict Arnold was then put in charge of the city. Arnold hung around the locals, particularly the elites, who held pro-British sentiment. One of these elites, an 18-year-old named Peggy Shippen, would become his second wife on April 8, 1779, as his first wife died four years earlier. Now in charge of Philadelphia, Arnold, once again only caring about his own desires, decided to profit off of his position, which led local politicians to become very suspicious of him and even start to press charges. His conduct was so poor in Philadelphia that George Washington, one of the only people that actually liked Arnold, felt the need to write a formal rebuke of his actions, calling them imprudent and improper. Arnold was fed up now. Instead of correcting his mistakes, Arnold saw Washington's comments as betrayal. And so, through his pride, as well as the influence of his new friends, Arnold decided to try to get revenge on the people he believed had wronged him. He resigned his post in Philadelphia and came up with a plan to give Britain control of the Hudson River, splitting the colonies in half. He gained a position in charge of West Point and began communicating with the British in order to surrender the fort to them. However, his plan was discovered by the Americans and Arnold was discovered as a traitor. When Washington heard about all this, he was deeply upset. Arnold wasn't just a fellow officer, he was a friend. And now it would have to be his duty to capture the traitor, the man he used to hold in such high regard. Arnold managed to narrowly escape capture before he would then join the British army as a brigadier general, fighting his own people. He went down to Virginia where he captured Richmond in December of 1780 and began raiding the area. Several months later, he went up to Connecticut in September of 1781, leading raids not far from where he had grown up. But then, about a month later, on October 19th, 1781, Lord Cornwallis surrendered to the United States in Yorktown, leading to an end to the conflict. Arnold left America and headed for London, where he lived out the rest of his life. Upon arriving in London, it seemed as though even the British weren't all that excited to have him there, with people like Edmund Burke saying that Arnold should never be in charge of a British army again. Arnold restarted his trade in the West Indies, but never achieved the same success he had in America. Late in his life, Benedict greatly regretted what he did. He felt an enormous shame as he knew that he was a traitor, at one point saying during a visit from Talleyrand, I am perhaps the only American who cannot give you letters for his own country. All the relations I had there are now broken. I must never return to the States. And in 1801, while on his deathbed, he reportedly said, Let me die in this old uniform in which I fought my battles. May God forgive me for ever having put on another. Arnold has been remembered as America's most terrible traitor. A man who believed in the ideals of the American Revolution, but turned his back on it. But is that really accurate? Arnold never really cared about America. He never cared about his people, nor about liberty. He only ever cared about himself. He only ever joined the fight for liberty because the British taxes were hurting his profits. 
and it was his pride and arrogance that led him to turn his back on his people and his only friends, and it would only be until it was far too late for him to truly realize what he had done. It's ironic that the man who only ever cared about his own image and reputation would end up becoming one of the most hated men in American history, ending up with his legacy as the American Brutus. So, I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, make sure to stick around for more. And hey, you can also maybe subscribe or something. So, that's it for today's video. Well, till next time, see ya.